What is up you guys? So in this one, we're going to introduce you to discrete time sinusoidal signals. That is, we're going to describe what this type of signal is, give three of its main properties that are very different from the continuous time case, right? And finally, illustrate those properties through MATLAB. So without further ado, let's get started. So unlike continuous time, sinusoidal signals that we talked about in the previous lecture where the independent variable is a continuous one a discrete time sinusoidal signal may be expressed as the following so it is also characterized using three parameters the amplitude the frequency or angular frequency measured in radians per sample right and the phase that is measured in radians okay now as we did previously we can express omega as 2 pi f where f stands for frequency that is measured in hertz in that case we can express our sinusoid as a cosine 2 pi fn plus theta right the frequency is also measured in hertz or cycles per samples. Now for the moment, we consider that the discrete time sinusoid that we have in this equation or this equation is somehow independent of what we had in the continuous time case that is over here. Even though that's not completely true because you can always obtain this guy by sampling it at t equal n uppercase t where the period is one second, right? Now let me show you an example on such a sinusoidal signal. In MATLAB, I'm going to define an omega that is pi over six and a frequency that is one over 12 and a theta that is pi over three, right? Then I'm going to take my x and type in a cosine two pi f t plus theta and it's going to give me an error telling me you didn't define your a so my a I'm going to set it to be one and go ahead again and I'm going to get another error telling me that you didn't define t let's go ahead and define t and go from minus 12 to 12 okay let's go ahead and stem plot x versus t oh we have to execute this guy it works stem and there you have the figure so this is an example of a discrete time sinusoidal signal with angular frequency pi over 6 which corresponds to f that is 1 over 12 so if i go ahead and type in 2 pi times f i get omega right we didn't use omega here if you would generate another signal call it y and instead of your 2 pi f, type in omega and plot on the same figure y, you get the same thing, right? Because it's the same signal. So the sinusoidal discrete time signal is of amplitude 1, angular frequency pi over 6, or equivalently frequency 1 over 12, and an offset or phase shift of pi over 3, right? Now, in contrast to continuous time sinusoids, Discrete time sinusoids are characterized by slightly different properties, where property one tells us that discrete time sinusoids are periodic if and only if, if f, its frequency, is a rational number. Okay? Now, to see this or to prove this, a discrete time signal, say x of n, is periodic if and only if there exists a number uppercase n such that x of n is x of n plus uppercase n, right? Just like property one in continuous time sinusoidal signals, x of t plus t is x of t. Then we say that uppercase t is the period of my continuous time sinusoidal signal. Well, actually over here, the smallest value of n for which this is true is called the fundamental period so this is by definition now the proof here 
is very simple. For a sinusoid with frequency f0, say we've got a frequency f0, to be periodic, we should have that if we replace the expression over here, then we get that we should have the following expression, right? So A cancels out with A, right? So we get this expression right here without the A. And you should notice that this relation is true if and only if you can find, so if there exists an integer K, so set Z is the set of all integers, okay? Such that my two pi F zero of N is equal to two K pi. So it's as if this guy is not there, right? So once you expand this thing over here, you get a two pi F zero N plus two pi F zero uppercase N, right? Then you've got identical terms in the cosine except for the term that contains two pi F zero uppercase N. So to get rid of that term, it suffices to find an integer K such that this term that is, you know, appended onto this term is a multiple of two pi, right? What that means is that if you cancel out the pi, the two pi on both sides, you get that F zero is K over N. Okay. So according to this ratio, a discrete time sinusoidal signal is periodic if and only if its frequency F zero is expressed as a ratio of two integers. That is, F zero is a rational number, right? Now to determine the fundamental period uppercase N, all we need to do is express its frequency F zero as a ratio over here and cancel common terms or common factors between the numerator and the denominator so that K and N are relatively prime. Then once you have F zero expressed as a ratio of two relatively prime or co-prime numbers, then your denominator is your fundamental period. Now, so let me give you an example over here. So if, if I have an F zero, that is 20 over 30, right? If I gave you a sinusoid with the following F, frequency, right? You can't just go ahead and tell me, oh, my 30 is the fundamental period. No, because you can further factor or reduce this ratio into two over three, right? Two and three are co-primes and hence three is your fundamental period, right? Okay, 30 is a period, but it's not the fundamental period because it's not the smallest integer where X of N will repeat itself. Right now, a very slight note over here is that any small changes in frequency may result in catastrophic large changes in the period. Let me show you a small example. So beware the following concept. Um, say you've got a frequency, let's say F1, that is 31 over 60, right? 31 and 60 are co-prime and so, 60 is your fundamental period over here, right? However, if you change this ratio 31 over 60 to something like 30 over 60, this is just a slight change in the frequency, right? 30 and 60 are no longer co-prime because you can write this ratio as half, one over two. And hence your fundamental period is two. So small changes in frequency might lead to a very large change in the fundamental period, okay? So that's property number one that you should keep in mind when dealing with discrete time signals. Property number two tells us that if we have two discrete time sinusoidal signals where one angular frequency is the other plus 2k pi, then both sinusoids are actually identical, okay? It suffices to replace, so my, my signal x0 of n corresponding to angular frequency omega 0 is nothing other than a cosine omega 0 n plus theta, right? Whereas x1 of n corresponding to angular frequency omega 1 is a cosine omega 1 n plus theta, replacing this 
expression, we get a cosine omega zero n plus two k pi n plus theta. Now we we know that cosine x plus two k pi n is cosine x. So we're back to a cosine omega zero n plus theta, that is x zero of n. Okay. Now why is this important? Why do you care? Now we'll see in future lectures that when we study frequencies, we're going to limit ourselves between minus pi and pi when talking about angular frequencies. Let's say this is the frequency axis omega and this guy is the frequency spectrum x omega. Okay. Um, we're going to see that if this is my minus pi and this is my pi that if I study the spectrum of this signal over here, let's say it looks something like this, right? Um, let's say this is a three pi, which is pi plus two pi. And this is a minus three pi over here, which is minus pi minus two pi, right? Then you're doing nothing. If you study the behavior of your signal between pi and three pi or anything outside minus pi till pi, you're basically just coming again over here. So once you look at the spectrum over here, it's just a replica of what you have between minus pi and pi. So it repeats itself. You're not gaining any information if you look outside this band, right? It's just a replica of what you have inside. And this comes actually from this observation over here. So if you're looking at a frequency, let's say over here, omega zero, it's the same as looking at the frequency over here, its companion or its alias, we call it its alias. Um, it's an omega zero plus two pi, right? This is omega zero plus two pi. So you get the same piece of information, right? This guy over here, omega zero plus two pi and so on. You get the same thing, omega zero plus four pi plus six pi and so on. And the same thing once you go to negative frequencies. So omega zero minus two pi is somewhere over here and so on. You get the point. So because of this similarity, we call the sinusoid having the frequency outside minus pi to pi an alias of a corresponding sinusoid with frequency less than in magnitude less than pi. Thus, we will almost all the time look at frequencies in the range of minus pi to pi or equivalently in terms of f. So if my omega is between minus pi and pi, what does this tell me in terms of frequency f? So my omega is two pi f, which is between minus pi and pi divided by two pi on both sides. We get an f that is between minus half and half. So in terms of f, my minus pi pi becomes minus half half. Okay. You're just dividing your axis or you're scaling by a factor of one over two pi. Okay. Now it is really important to notice that the difference between discrete time sinusoids and continuous time sinusoids is very, very important in terms of frequencies because uppercase omega in terms of continuous time sinusoids varies between minus infinity and plus infinity. So for continuous signals, it's, there's no aliasing. There's no replica. You don't, well, you could generate a signal that replicates itself, but generally for sinusoidal signals, it's not the case. Okay. Okay. That's it for property two. And one last property I'd like to tell you about is, is that the highest rate of oscillation is when omega in magnitude is pi or equivalently when f in magnitude is half. This is a consequence of property two. Notice that since everything outside this band is repeated, then is, there's no need of looking outside the band of minus pi to pi, right? So your infinity in terms of frequency is your pi. Okay. So your pi should be replaced with an infinity, then three pi is three infinity, which is the same as infinity, right? So the best way to show what I mean is through an illustration. So let's go to MATLAB and let us open a figure. Here's my figure. Okay. And let us investigate how cosine omega n behaves with different frequencies. So 
First, I'm going to choose an omega that is zero. And then I'm going to plot, do I have a T? Yes, I do. So I'm going to plot X zero, that is cosine zero times, well, this is my T, let's call it an N. Sorry about that. So my N is going from minus 12 or counting from minus 12 to 12. And my X zero signal is cosine omega zero N where omega zero is zero. So back again. And then just let us stem. This is my cosine, right? Let me open another figure. There I have it. And let's increase the frequency a bit. Let's say I choose an omega zero to be, I don't know, pi over eight. And let's call x one cosine omega one times n, right? What is omega one? Oh, sheesh. I changed omega zero. I should have omega one. That is pi over eight. No problem. This is my x1. Stem to plot. And there you go. Actually, I want to plot n. x1 versus n, not t, even though they're the same in this setting. Anyways, so this is my x1 signal with frequency pi over 8. Let's give it a title saying omega is pi over 8, right? Okay, open another figure. There you go. Call an omega two, that is pi over four. So as you can see, I doubled my frequency. My x two right now should be omega cosine omega two n. And let's plot that thing. There you go. You see that the rate of oscillation is increasing. This time my omega is pi over four. Good. Now let's put a frequency of pi over two and see what happens. Pi over two x3 is cosine omega 3 times n, right? Let's open a figure. Here's my figure. Um, let me put that thing over here, this thing over here, right? Over here, okay? Let's call x omega 4 is pi over 2. Let's call x4 as cosine omega 4 times n, right? Now let's stem that thing. Let's give it a title. There you go. And one last plot I'd like to show you is when the extreme case, when my omega five is pi, right? In that case, I'm going to define an X five that is cosine omega five times N. And now I'm going to stem and plot X five. And there you go. So what do we observe over here? We didn't give a title for the first figure. So let me go to figure one and give it a title, mega equals zero. Good, so we see that we're varying the frequency from small to big, from zero, pi over eight, pi over four, pi over two, and pi. Observe what's happening over here. We see that, indeed, the higher we go in frequency, we have a higher rate of oscillation. I mean, look here, we had three cycles over here, we had more cycles, like six or seven. Right here, more one, two, three, four, five, and in omega equal pi, we had the highest number of cycles. Now, what happens when I go beyond that? What happens if I go to, let's say, two pi plus pi over eight? It's higher than pi, right? So let's see what happens. Let's pick an omega six, that is pi over eight plus two pi. Call x six, that is cosine omega six times n, open a figure, put it over here, move out of the way. Okay, and stem this thing. As you can see, we replicated the signal. It's the exact copy. And hence the rate of oscillation decreased. That's my point over here. So the rate of oscillation peaks up at omega equal pi. And after that, it decreases back and then repeats itself. So my omega equal pi is the maximum rate of oscillation I could attain. Okay. So that's about it. I hope you found this lecture beneficial. This one, we talked about discrete time sinusoidal signals, gave its parameters that are the amplitude, frequency, and phase, and three very important and different properties from the continuous time case. Thanks for watching. If you found this lecture beneficial, please leave a like on the video, subscribe to the channel, 
If you have any questions whatsoever, kindly leave a comment down in the comment section below. And I'll make sure I'll get to it as soon as possible. Also consider donating to my Patreon account any amount you wish. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in future lectures.